Now, this is a very special occasion for me. It is the fourth in our series of our Monash Israel oration, launched exactly four years ago and hopefully becoming an, a staple annual event in the life of Monash University. But this is <clears throat> such a special one for me that I'm at the risk of losing my voice. I couldn't, could have presented our orator tonight from my professorial chair as a colleague, fellow professor, Professor Oz of Bersheva University, a great teacher of comparative literature. I could have presented him to you as Israel's perhaps best known, perhaps most prolific, and arguably most adventurous writer today, the author of 27 books translated into over 30 languages. I could have presented him to you as the laureate of the Goethe Prize in Germany, the Frankfurt Peace Prize, the Prix Femina of Paris, um, an honorary chevalier of the French Legion of Honor, and of course a laureate, not least, of the Israel Prize. I could have presented him to you as a courageous and unwavering political and public voice for over 50 years now in the Israeli public and political scene. I could have done all that, but instead, I would like for a change, and that is a very unusual professorial moment for me, to present to you our, my dear father, our Monash Israel orator for tonight, Amos Oz. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, friends, good evening, shalom, and Erev Tov to all of you. What a pleasure it is to be here tonight, and what a particular delight to be introduced so warmly by my wonderful daughter, Professor Fania Oz Salzberger. I've got some news from you, for you, Fania. As from tonight, you are going to introduce me every night at bed dinner. My friends, countries and nations are born out of geography. They are born out of history, out of politics, and out of demography. Israel was born out of a dream. And everything, everything at all that is born out of a dream is destined to feel like a slight disappointment. The only way to keep a dream perfect and rosy, and intact, and unspoiled, is never to try to live it out. A fulfilled dream is a disappointing dream. This is true of uh, writing a novel, this is true of building a house, this is true of living out a sexual fantasy, and this is true of building a nation. Israel has a certain air of disappointment about it, but this disappointment is not in the nature of Israel, it is in the nature of dreams. Now I just said that Israel was born out of a dream. This is inaccurate. Israel was born out of an entire spectrum of dreams. A federation of master plans and blueprints and visions. And many of those initial dreams of the founding fathers and mothers of Israel were contradictory and even mutually exclusive. I'll give you some examples. Some of the early founders of Israel dreamt of reviving the biblical kingdoms of David and Solomon, a nation of prophets and peasants and city dwellers and soldiers in the biblical style. Still others dreamt of creating a replica of a Jewish shtetl from Eastern Europe with all the institutions of the shtetl and the atmosphere of the shtetl and the heritage of the shtetl. 
Still others aspired for a middle European paradise with red tiled roofs and a lot of peace and quiet and gemütlichkeit and good manners and people calling each other Frau Director or Herr Doctor. Still others wanted Israel to become a Marxist paradise. They dreamed, those funders of Hashomer Hatzair Kibbutzim, who were avid Marxists, they dreamt that one day Stalin himself will come for a visit on a kibbutz. And they will give Stalin the grand tour, they will show him the chicken poultry and the cow sheds and the, and the children's houses. And then they will drag Stalin to the communal dining hall for a lengthy debate into the night about the real nature of Marxism-Leninism. And they will teach him what, once and for all what Marxism-Leninism really means because they knew better than Stalin. I'm not being ironical, they really knew be better than Stalin. And at the end of the night, so they dreamt, they will have Ra Stalin rise to his feet and say to them in juicy Russian, well, bloody Jews, you have done socialism here better than we did in Russia, and then die of happiness. <laughs> and next door to those Marxist-Leninists, and next door to the Biblicalists, and next door to the Shtetlists, there lived the funders of my own kibbutz, Hulda who were semi-religious social anarchists. I know this sounds completely crazy, but this, what, this is what they were. They were inspired by Tolstoy and by Aaron David Gordon, not by Marx. They wanted Israel to evolve not into a nation state with government and army and institution, but into a loose federation of small rural communities where people will toil the land and come to constant not in constant touch with nature and cure and improve their souls by this daily touch with nature and by sharing everything and undergo a kind of non-synagogial religious experience through nature and sharing everything. Semi-religious social anarchists. And I could go on for the rest of tonight or write a trilogy, which I still threaten to do one day, about the huge spectrum of dreams and visions and master plans and ideas which were with the funding fathers and mothers of Israel. Of course, it was impossible for all those dreams to come true. Partly because, as I said, it's not in the nature of dreams to come fully true. Partly because those dreams were contradictory and mutually ex exclusive. So whatever became of those dreams, some of those dreams eh, are still alive and struggling with each other under different banners. Others are somewhat fulfilled. Some have turned into nightmares. There is, ladies and gentlemen, a huge difference between Israel of the media and the real Israel. Israel of the media, Israel of the CNN and the other television nets, consists of about 80% fundamentalist, ultra-religious West Bank settlers, 19% ruthless soldiers at the roadblocks, and 1% wonderful intellectuals like myself who criticize the government and struggle for peace. This picture has nothing to do with the nature of Israel. Actually, the Israeli coastal plain is a very Mediterranean land. Unlike Herzl's dream of building an Austro-Hungary in the heart of the Middle East, Unlike the Tolstoyan dream or the Marxist dream, it's a very Mediterranean country. Temperamental, noisy, warm-hearted, pushy, argumentative, very middle class, very materialistic, very hedonistic, and at the same time immensely creative. Secular to the bone, this entire coastal plain from Naharia to Ashkelon, and actually from Metula to Arad and to Eilat, all this Israel is very different than the picture you get on the media. 
Um, it is, as I said, a very Mediterranean country, a very talkative country. There are, of course, pockets of painful poverty, of misery, of seclusion and exclusion and rejection and fanaticism. We have our share of fanatics, same as any other country and perhaps even a little more. But at the same time, it is a fact that Israel is vibrating with diversity. And I think this cuts deep into the Jewish tradition. If you promise to take the following with a big grain of salt, I'm going to tell you that Israel is neither a nation nor a country. Rather, it is a fiery collection of arguments. Seven and a half million citizens, seven and a half million prime ministers, seven and a half million prophets and messiahs. Everyone shouts at the tops of their voices. No one ever listens except for me. I listen sometimes, that's how I make a living. <laughs> Israel is an open air seminary. Every line by a bus stop in Israel is likely to catch a spark and turn into a vivacious street seminary with total strangers debating passionately on politics, on history, on religion, on morality and on strategy. With the participants of such a street seminary, while disagreeing with each other on political and metaphysical good and evil, are nevertheless elbowing their way to the top of the line. You will figure from what I just said that I love Israel even at times when I don't like it. I love Israel even at times when I can't stand it. But this kind of relationship exists in the best of families. The country is deeply divided. It's divided, fortunately, not according a single barricade, but across many differing and crisscrossing barricades. It's divided over state and church, or in our case, state and synagogue. It's divided between hawks and doves. It's divided between the very rich on the one hand and the middle class and the poor on the other hand. It's divided between Ashkenazi and Sephardi. It's divided between Jew and Arab. It's divided between everybody and everyone because everybody knows better. The country is arguing. Let me tell you, a, recall an episode from many years ago when I was recruited as a reservist with a tank unit on the eve of the Six Day War in 1967. And on the last evening, just before the outbreak of the actual fighting, I was sitting with my men on a hillside, round a campfire, and we were arguing, what else? Guessing different scenarios for the impending battle. At some point, the general turned in our midst. The general being the supreme commander of the Israeli army on the Egyptian front at that war, General Tal. That was quiet. And the general shared with us a general outline of his own perspective for the impending battle. He was interrupted after about five or six sentences by a middle-aged, rotund, bespectacled corporal reserve corporal, who asked him politely, excuse me, general, have you ever read Tolstoy's War and Peace? <laughs> the general said, of course, I've read it. What, what kind of question? I've read it many times. Are you aware, general, of the fact that you are about to repeat exactly the same conceptual mistake which, according to Tolstoy, the Russians committed over the Battle of Borodino? In no time, the entire platoon was immersed in a fiery, screamy debate on Tolstoy, on war and peace, on strategy, on the purpose of war, on the rationale of the war, on everything, with everybody sc screaming at everyone else at the tops of their voices, including the general, including the corporal. It turned out that the corporal was a professor of Russian literature in Tel Aviv University, <laughs> but the general had a degree in philosophy from Jerusalem University high above. 
This, if you wish, is Israel in a nutshell, but I wouldn't like to idealize it. We have our share of fanatics. We have our share of extremists. We have our share of walking exclamation mark. This is my definition of a fanatic, a walking exclamation mark. People who would never listen to anyone else, people who are self-righteous to the point of near violence, people who will not stop at anything when they have a faith in something. People who will die or kill for a cause, people who are looking for a cause for which to die or to kill. Um, many diaspora Jews are telling us Israelis, can't you lower your voices a little bit when you argue with one another, for heaven's sake? Can't you keep your differences to yourselves? You are embarrassing us in, friend, in front of our non-Jewish neighbors here in the diaspora. Please, hush down. No way, my friends. For me, one of the delights and the privileges of being a citizen of the free state of Israel is that at long last I feel free to conduct my disagreements with the neighbors at the top of my voice and the hell with the neighbors. This is freedom for me. Now, as I said, diversity originates from a very long Jewish tradition. It's not for nothing that Jews never had a pope, nor could they have a pope. If anyone ever called himself or herself the pope of the Jews, everybody will be approaching this pope, slapping him or her on the back, saying, hi pope, you don't know me and I don't know you, but my grandfather and your uncle used to do business together back in Minsk or back in Casablanca, and therefore you be quiet for just five minutes and let me tell you once and for all what is it that God really wants for us. <laughs> Everyone knows better. And this, let me tell you, has been in the heart and soul of the Jewish tradition. It is a civilization of doubt and argument. It is a civilization of diversity and difference. It is a civilization of disagreement. When I am asked what is my explanation to the longevity of the Jewish people, how come that mighty empires rose and fell and superpowers emerged and disappeared? and the Jewish people is still alive, how come I say we argue? We have always argued. Our holy texts, the prophets, the Talmud, the rabbinical literature from the Middle Ages, these are books of debates and arguments and disagreements. People beg to differ, people beg to disagree, people beg to challenge. Uh, there is a certain element of latent, latent anarchism in the Jewish heritage, and I think this is the most wonderful gene of the Jewish civilization, this latent anarchism. No one simply complies. No one simply says humbly, yes, sir, you are right, I comply. Everybody knows better. It's not only in the Jewish tradition to argue with each other, it's also a very honorable Jewish tradition to argue with God himself, which would have been unthinkable in other religions and in other traditions. This dates all the way back to Abraham, who bargains with God over the destiny of the sinful city of Sodom, like a shrewd second-hand car dealer, 50 righteous men, 40 righteous men, 30, 20, maybe 10. And when Abraham loses his argument with God, and you don't win arguments when you argue with him, Abraham doesn't fall to his knees and apologize for the chutzpah, for daring to bargain with God, oh no. He turns his eyes upwards and he pronounces the daring sentence, Hashofet, Kol ha'aretz lo yase mishpat. Would not the judge of all the earth do right? 
In other words, you, God, might be the chief executive, but you are not above the law. You, God, might be the legislator, but you are still not above the law. The law is above you. And I sue you, God, in the name of justice. This is unthinkable in Christianity and as far as I know unthinkable in, in Islam and in other traditions. But this is the essence of Jewish tradition. The prophets argue with God and challenge God. Job argues with God and challenges God. My all-time favorite Talmud story, Tanuro Shel Achnai, Achnai's Oven, which I'll share with you because it's a delightful story, is about argument with God. It's about two saintly rabbis, Rabbi Yehoshua and Rabbi Tarfon, who disagree over a certain interpretation of the law. And in their capacity as judges, they have to pass judgment and they cannot decide. So they argue for seven days and seven nights. They don't eat, they don't sleep, they argue. After seven days and seven nights, a bat call is heard from above, a voice is heard from above. Rabbi Yehoshua is right, Rabbi Tarfon is wrong, go to sleep. Go to sleep is not in the text, but it's in the pretext. This is not the end of the story. The loser, Rabbi Tarfon, raises his eyes upwards and says, God Almighty, you have given the Torah to human beings, so please you keep out of this. <laughs> Even this is not the end of the story. Rabbi Tarfon is not struck by a lightning for his impudence, for his chutzpah, oh no. Another bat call, another voice is heard from above saying, Nitzchuni Banai. My sons have defeated me. In other words, touche, I give in. And this continues through the Middle Ages. There are wonderful Hasidic tales about rabbis who sue God to appear before a court of justice to justify his actions. Of course, God never appears to this rabbinical court of justice and apparently he cannot justify all his actions in the world or maybe he can, who am I to tell? But rabbis sue God to appear before a rabbinical court of justice. And this is a strong Hasidical tradition. And this tradition pursues and continues right into contemporary modern Israeli Hebrew literature. The poet Yehuda Amichai echoes Abraham arguing with God over Sodom when he writes, El male rachamim, il male ha el male rachamim, hayu ha rachamim ba'olam velo rakbo. And in my humble translation, the Lord is full of mercy. Were he not so full of mercy, there may have been some mercy in the world not just in him. It's the same chutzpedic tradition, the same unyielding tradition. Yes, Jews argue. Yes, Israel is diverse. Don't worry about this diversity. I believe diversity is a wonderful climate for creativity as long as this diversity is not violent, as long as this diversity is not violent. People ask me sometimes, when do you expect the Jewish civil war to break out? When are the Israelis going to start shooting at each other? Give us some healthy civil war. Foreign cor correspondents who come to interview me in my place in Arad often ask me this question with growing impatience. When are you Israelis going to give us a juicy little civil war? And the answer is that for 120 years of modern Israel, since the beginning of modern Zionism, we have been fighting a civil war, an internal civil war, not one, many, along many different barricades. But these were, with one or few terrible exceptions, these were verbal civil wars. We fight our civil wars by calling each other terrible names, thus giving each other ulcers and heart attacks, in short, a traditional Jewish battle. As long as this diversity remains, 
non-violent. It's a source of blessing. It's a wonderful climate for creativity, for invention, for, re for renewal, for culture. I think the more diversity, the more creative genes are at work. And I hope Israel will remain, di remain diverse forever. I don't expect a decision in those diversities. I don't want to see a clear-cut decision in most of the, the, those diversities. The issue of synagogue and state is going to remain unresolved for as far as my eye can see, unless we want to fight a, a violent civil war. Many other issues are going to remain unresolved. It's not easy to live with an open-ended situation. But I believe there is a great wisdom in living with an open-ended situation. I'm a great believer in compromises, in a system of compromises. I know the word compromise has a very negative connotation in the ears of young idealists. They tend to think that compromise is inconsistent, that compromise is immoral, that compromise is lack of integrity. Not in my vocabulary. In my vocabulary, the word compromise is synonymous with the word life. Where there is life, there ought to be compromises. And the opposite of compromise is not idealism. And the opposite of compromise is not integrity. The opposite of compromise is fanaticism and death. And I know one or two things about fanaticism. In fact, I think it's high time that every university and every school in the world start a course in comparative fanaticism because it's all over us. It's everywhere. Now, there are two strict precondition, preconditions for the prosperity and creativity of Israel in the future. One, we have to terminate the occupation of the West Bank and the Palestinian people and find a livable compromise between ourselves and the Palestinians. <clears throat> the conflict between Israeli and Palestinian is not a Hollywood movie with good guys and bad guys. It's a tragic clash between right and right. The Palestinians are in Palestine because they have no other country. They are not Jordanians, they are not Egyptians, they are not Lebanese. They were forced into exile into Lebanon and Jordan and Egypt, but they were treated as Palestinians, not as equals. They were forced to become aware of their Palestinianness. So they are in Palestine because they have no other, in, no other country. We are in Israel for exactly the same reason. We have no other country. The Jewish people as a people never had any homeland but the land of Israel. As individuals, yes. Many Jewish individuals have found homes in many other countries. But as a people, as a nation, the Jews never had another home. So this very tiny land, smaller than Denmark, happens to be the one and only homeland of the Palestinians and the one and only homeland of the Israelis. It's a clash between one very powerful, very convincing, very genuine claim over the land and another no less powerful, no less convincing, no less genuine claim over the same land. But essentially, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real estate dispute. Whose land? The fanatics on both sides are trying to turn it into a religious war, into a holy war, into a war over whose God it is not. It is essentially a real estate dispute, and as such, as a real estate dispute, it can be resolved with a compromise. There is going to be a state of Palestine one day next door to the state of Israel in peace and coexistence. And let me share with you some good news because you always hear the bad news from the Middle East. The good news is that the vast majority of the Israeli Jews and the vast majority of the Palestinian Arabs know now that in the end of the day there will be two states, Palestine next 
door to Israel. Are they happy about it in Israel and in Palestine? They are not happy about it. Will they be dancing in the streets when the two-state solution is implemented? They will not be dancing in the streets, neither in Palestine nor in Israel. But they know it now. And this is a big step forward because for many, many years, for decades, the Palestinians and the other Arabs treated Israel as a passing infection. If they only scratch it hard enough, it will go away. The Israelis, for their part, treated the Palestinian issue for many years, for decades, as a non-issue, as no more than a vicious invention of a pan-Arabic propaganda machine. No longer. Now, both Israelis and Palestinians know that the other is real and that the other is not going to go anywhere. This is a good beginning. If I may use a metaphor, to characterize the present situation, I will say the following. The patient, Israeli and Palestinian, is unhappily ready for the surgery. The doctors are cowards. The leaderships don't seem to have the courage to know what in their heart of hearts they know they have to know, they have to do. Yet, the fact remains that the difference between the Palestinian position and the Israeli position now is about 150 square kilometers, which in Australian terms is a joke. In Israeli and Palestinian terms, it's a big difference, but it's smaller than it had ever been. The border dispute, including the dispute over Jerusalem, is a dispute over 150 square kilometers. Now both sides are going to have to take painful decisions. The partition of the land into two homelands, I think this is called in English a semi-detached house. The partition of the land into two homelands is going to feel like an amputation both to the Israelis and for the Palestinians. The Israelis will have to give up part of our ancestral homeland. And ironically, we Israelis will have to give up the most biblical part of the land. The Palestinians will have to give up much of what they regard as the original land of Palestine, towns and cities and villages which used to be Palestinian prior to 48, but they will have to give them up. In their hearts of heart of hearts, both sides are more or less ready. Not because their eyes open to see the light. I don't expect a happy ending to the conflict. I don't expect Israelis and Palestinians to hug one another in tears like long lost brothers saying, oh brother, take the land, who cares about the land? I give you the land, give me my love and forgive me. This is not going to happen. It's going to be a clenched teeth compromise. And all compromises are clenched teeth. There is no such thing as a happy compromise. But as I said earlier, compromise is life. Now the world often tends to view the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Israeli-Arab conflict in black and white. Good guys and bad guys. Villains and victims. This is all wrong. This is not a Hollywood movie, as I said. This is a clash between two just claims. And uh, many people in the world feel happy to launch a demonstration in favor of the good guys, sign a petition against the bad guys, and go to sleep feeling good about themselves. This is counterproductive. In fact, what the outside world could do now, now, at this point in time, is to offer both sides help and empathy to undergo the unavoidable surgery. You no longer have to choose between being pro-Israel and being pro-Palestine. You have to be pro-peace. You have to believe in the unavoidability of a compromise. It is no use to depict Israel as the devil and the Palestinians as the righteous victims or vice versa. It's no use. 
Both sides committed many sins and errors and villainies in the course of this long conflict. Both sides are guilty, but both sides have an unshakable right in the land. Now, the basic realization for Israelis and for the Palestinians can be squeezed into five words or six words. We are not alone in the country. We Israelis are not alone in the country. We Palestinians are not alone in the country. I don't like to make predictions and prophecies. It's hard to be a prophet coming from the land of the prophets. There is too much competition in the prophecy business. But I'll give you one prediction. There will be one day a Palestinian embassy in Israel and an Israeli embassy in Palestine. And those two embassies are going to be walking distance from one another because one of them will be in Jewish West Jerusalem and the other one is going to be in Palestinian East Jerusalem. This is going to hurt and hurt like hell, but there is simply no alternative. And the encouraging thing is that the majority know it now. I know there is the painful issue of the disputed holy places in Jerusalem. What do you do with the holy places? Whose holy places? I mentioned earlier the importance of living with an open-ended situations. Let me share with you my grandmother's wisdom. When I was a very little boy, I'm not changing the subject. I'm still on the subject of the holy places in Jerusalem, but let me tell you about my grandmother. When I was a very small boy, she explained to me in simple words the difference between Jew and Christian. Not Jew and Muslim, but Jew and Christian. And she said the following. She said, you see, my boy, the Christians believe that the Messiah has been here once and he will come back one day. We Jews believe that the Messiah has not been, been here, he is still to come. Over this, said my grandmother, you cannot imagine, my boy, how much hatred and persecution and bloodshed. Why, she said. Why can't everybody simply wait and see? If the Messiah comes saying, hello, it's nice to see you again, the Jews will have to apologize to the Christians. If, on the other hand, the Messiah comes saying, how do you do, it's nice to meet you, the entire Christian world will have to apologize to the Jews. Until then, live and let live. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the answer for the disputed holy places in Jerusalem and elsewhere. Let everybody worship. Let spatial arrangements be made so that everyone can worship in peace and honor and dignity and tolerance. And let no flag wave over those holy places until the coming of the Messiah. He or maybe she will tell us who's real God and who's holy places. Now, In September, maybe in October, the Palestinians are likely to declare unilaterally their own state and they will be probably recognized by the General Assembly of the United Nations. I think for historical reasons, Israel will do right to insist on being the first nation in the world to recognize the state of Palestine without necessarily recognizing the boundaries. The boundaries will remain open to negotiation and bargaining. But for historical reasons, let Israel be the first one to recognize the state of Palestine now that almost the entire spec political spectrum in Israel, from left-wing to right-wing Likud, accept the two-state solution, let us accept and welcome the state of Palestine into the family of nations and then go on arguing and debating and compromising over boundaries and spatial arrangements and securities and settlements and other painful issues. The other, this is one of the two main crucial questions on which the future of Israel depends. The other question is the question of social justice. 
You may be aware of the fact that in the last couple of weeks, massive demonstrations are launched in Israel. Massive rallies are launched in Israel. They are not organized by the, the opposition. They are not organized by the left wing. They are not enhanced by any political party. They are gra grassroots upheaval, which began as a protest against the inaffordability of accommodation in Israel. It's becoming so expensive that most people cannot afford it. And it then spread wings and became an outcry over social justice, an outcry over solidarity, social solidarity, an outcry over a welfare state. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel in the early days, in the 1950s, was a very, very poor country. More than just poor. It was perpetually on the verge of immediate bankruptcy. The 650,000 Jews of 1948, when Israel became a nation, these 650,000 Jews absorbed an influx of over a million immigrants, million new Jewish immigrants, in three years. No homes, no money, no resources, no hope. And nonetheless, in an unprecedented way, the early Israelis went out of their way to build homes and provide jobs for those newcomers. There was a deep sense of solidarity. I'm not idealizing those days either. They were not ideal. And not everybody was an idealist. And not everything was rosy. But these were times of deep sense of solidarity in Israeli society. Over the years, and with the new wave of values, a new system of values, we have lost much of this solidarity. What is happening in the streets of Israel these very days, even as you and I are sitting here and speaking tonight, is an outcry for the renewal of the social solidarity. It's not necessarily a call to bring down the government, although this might be part of it. It's not necessarily a call to dramatically change the distribution of riches in Israel, although it might be this as well. It is first and foremost an outcry for renewed solidarity. Israel's economy is a miracle. The unemployment rate in Israel is one of the lowest in the Western world. The prosperity, the booming of the Israeli economy, especially the high tech, is unprecedented. But this riches remains in very few hands. And the middle class, the backbone of Israel's economy, is not really benefiting from this prosperity. And it rebels, and it protests, and it cries for more solidarity. I think the other secret weapon of the Jewish people through the generations, not only Israel, but the Jewish people, the first secret weapon was diversity and argument. The second secret weapon is solidarity. If Israel remain unviolently diverse and with a strong sense of solidarity, is going to become a magnificent success story. If it's going to resolve its skirmish with the Palestinians, it's going to become an unprecedented success story. Let me conclude by telling you that even now, as we are talking here, Israel is, as you know, occupying the front pages of all the newspapers in the world. My own dream for Israel is to be removed once and for all from all the front pages and instead occupy and settle and annex and dominate the cultural supplements, the architectural supplements, the music supplements, the literary supplements, the gardening supplements of all the newspapers. The moment we conduct this kind of occupation and annexation, we have made it. There is, ladies and gentlemen, a kind of golden age in Israeli culture. 
There is a golden age in cinema, there is a golden age in literature, there is a golden age in the fine arts, there is a golden age in music, there is a golden age in the academy and in the sciences. Golden age is usually diagnosed when it's over, when people remember it with nostalgia. But let me tell you that in terms of cultural vivaciousness and cultural creativity, Israel is one of the most exciting countries in the world. Tel Aviv is one of the most creative cultural centers of the world today. And this, as I said, is the blessing of diversity, the blessing of solidarity, and hopefully, very soon, the blessing of peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. I, I wish I could still be sitting there and listening to you continue this incredible talk, and we're going to, however, open it up to the audience. Um, the last time I actually met you was 30 years ago when I was a student and you came to Australia, specifically to Canberra, and I have a very vivid recollection as a student, sitting on the grass with other students and conversing with you. And that conversation has really resonated with me all my life and your, your voice, a voice that, as we've all heard, is really a voice of poetry and a prophecy, is something that I know I've always carried with me all my life and I think that so many people here in this audience who have read your books have also carried it with them. Um, I also thank you for giving me the inspiration for renaming our centre and in the presence of the Dean and also the Chancellor, can we call our centre the Australian Centre for Latent Anarchy? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the way this will work, we're going to extend the grass and the conversation out to all of you here. And there are some strict rules, however, there are two microphones with ushers on either side, so there is one here and there is one here, and there is one somebody waving um, up there, and so if somebody wants to ask a question, please stand, you can queue behind the microphone, and I only have one request, and it's the obvious request, we're here to hear Amos Oz speak some more, so please make it a question. Um, so while people are going to the microphones, can I just uh, ask you to, you know, you've written, I think, we heard 27 books and you, can, you wrote an article in Haaretz yesterday and I know that you've been travelling on a long trip to Australia. This, what, what, what's the magical formula? How have you managed to be so prolific? What does your day look like that has allowed you to really create the most in incredible body of, of literature that cuts across all genres? Well, I have two pens on my desk in Arad. I don't write with a computer, I write with a pen in longhand. I have two pens, one black and one blue. When I have the urge to tell a story, I use one pen. And I tell a story. I don't tell a story in order to tell people what to do or what to believe in. I tell a story because I believe it is a primeval urge in all of us, not just in the writers, to tell stories and to hear stories. Ever since we were very little children, we need to tell stories and we need to hear story, stories. This is like the need to dream, it's an urge. The other pen is to tell the government to go to hell. <laughs> and I've been re writing the same article more or less 500 times over those years, telling the government, many governments, many different governments, again and again and again, dear government, please go to hell. They read my, my articles and for some reasons they don't go to hell, but I don't tire of writing, of telling them to go there. Maybe one day they will. Okay, and um, we've got a question here. Hello. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, this is my question. Obviously in the past six months, one of arguably the worst ever crime against 
or act of Palestinian terrorism was the murder of the Fogel family. And I read that something like 40% of respondents on the West Bank among the Palestinian street approved of the Fogel murders. How is Israel able to negotiate with that viewpoint? And more to the point, where is the Palestinian Amos Oz? And is he being listened to, not on the pages of Western broadsheets, but on the Palestinian street? Well, there are Palestinian Amos Ozes. <laughs> to name one, my friend and colleague, Seri Nuseiba, who is a Palestinian intellectual, academic, who has been persistently and courageously calling for a compromise with the Israelis and for a two-state solution. And he is one of many. Yes, there are Palestinians who endorse terrorism. I know that. I don't know that they are 40%, but I'm impressed by the fact that 60% of the Palestinians condemned the uh, uh, barbaric murder of the, of the whole family. And I'm impressed by the fact that the majority of the Palestinians, as well as the majority of the Israelis, are tired. Innocent blood was shed by both sides, not just by the Israelis. Not just by the Palestinians and not just by the Israelis. Both sides shed a lot of innocent blood. And a peace is something you make with an enemy. You don't make peace with the enemy because the enemy is nice. You don't make peace with the enemy because the enemy is just. You don't make peace with the enemy because the enemy is lovely. You make peace with the enemy because it is the enemy. And Israelis and Palestinians have no other choice but to make peace because no one of them is ever moving out. The Palestinians are in Palestine to stay and we Israelis are in Israel to stay. We have to replace the cycle of bloodshed and violence and hatred by a peaceful coexistence, not necessarily by love. In the early days of the 60s, when the uh, flower generation promoted the slogan, make love, not war, I used to say that my slogan vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians is, make peace, not love. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Todoraba, merci beaucoup. Have you given this talk in Israel and in Palestine in the appropriate language? If you have, what happened? If you haven't, why not? Well, I have poured the same wisdom for many, many years on Israeli audiences, on Palestinian audiences, on everyone who would listen. What happened is often outcries of anger and discontent. And I'm used to cries of anger and discontent from the extremists on both sides. But yes, the answer is yes, I have said the same things for many, many years, both for to Israelis and to Palestinians, in every platform I have been provided with and on every occasion I have been given. Look, it's not easy for enemies to accept each other's stretched hand. It's not easy for enemies because there is the weight of the injuries and the insults and the wounds and the, the hurt feelings. But the art of making peace is based on the realization that there is no real alternative to peace simply none. We can fight another cycle of war and yet another one and yet another one. We may beat the Arabs in another war and yet another war and yet another war. They will not go away. We will not go away either. And as I said, the good news is that there is, according to public opinion surveys, both in Israel and in Palestine, there is a solid majority on both sides who is willing now to accept with clenched teeth a two-state solution. Upstairs. Okay, there's a question upstairs. Just two, Mr. Oz, just two hours ago we saw Hosni Mubarak being wheeled into a, yes, a cage in a courtroom in Cairo. 
I'm just wondering if you could predict with such a recent event where you think Egypt's going and where its place will be in the Middle East in a year or two. Well, in the upheaval in the Arab world, I tend to avoid generalizations. What is possible in Egypt may be impossible in Syria. What is possible in Jordan may be impossible in Yemen. I think it's a mistake to speak about the Arab Spring as if the other Arab world was another Eastern Europe in the last days of communism. In fact, in some Arab countries, such as Egypt, there is at least a nucleus of a civil society, and therefore at least a potential for democracy. In other Arab countries, there is no sign of civil society, there is no sign of, middle, of a middle class, and therefore no chance for democracy. In all those rebellions in the Arab world, there is a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde marching together on the same rallies and on the same demonstrations. You will find in the streets of Cairo and in the streets of Damascus and in the streets of Amman and in the streets of other Arab capital cities marching shoulder to shoulder Democrats, liberals, open society supporters, women's liberators, side by side with fundamentalist, fanatic Islamists. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who is going to prevail where is not for me to predict. But let me answer a question you didn't ask, a relevant question. I think the worst tragedy of the entire Islamic world, not just the Arab world, but the Islamic world, is the oppression of women. Where women are oppressed, where women are oppressed and kept illiterate, there is a very small chance that the young children will develop into open-minded and broad-minded and tolerant human beings. They are likely to evolve into another generation of narrow-minded, women-oppressing fanatics. As long as the oppression of women continues in the Arab and the Islamic world, it will be very hard to aspire for a major change. On the other hand, it may be that part of the change in some of the Arab world will include the liberation of women. I hope so with all my heart. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for developing a beautiful narrative about the Jewish people and about Israel and a land of diversity and arguing and dreams. I was wondering if you could create a similar narrative for us, since you presumably know better than we do, about our neighbors. And who, what's the character of our neighbors of the Palestinians? What type of people are they? Well, I'm not an expert on Palestinian affairs, and it is for a Palestinian novelist to elaborate about the character of the Palestinians, not for me. But for all I know, the Palestinian people are right now an oppressed people. They are one of the last remaining oppressed peoples in the world. There are very few other people in the world who are oppressed under foreign military government. In the Palestinian society, as in other Arab societies, there are different forces at work. There are fundamentalist Islamists, there are Hamas people, there are liberals, there are open-minded pragmatists. There is a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the Palestinian society as well. And we've got a question here. Yes, it was recently reported that the Knesset recently voted something commending in, in regard to Jabotinsky uh, more than 70 years ago. In the interest of compromise for the uh, Israeli people, does that disturb you? I'm, sure, I'm not sure I understood the question. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question, I'll, please? I'll try again. Uh, it was recently reported the Knesset voted something commending Jabotinsky, Zev Jabotinsky, the leader of the revisionists. Now, in your interest of compromise, 
Does that disturb you that the Knesset recently voted that? Why should that disturb me? I regard Jabotinsky as a very great Zionist leader whose ideas I don't share and whose politics I don't accept, but I regard him as one of the founding fathers and the great dreamers of modern Israel, and I think he belongs in the pantheon of the founding fathers and mothers of Israel. If I can just um, interject, you've talked a lot about the argument and the diversity in Israel, but some people have observed that over the last year or two, that argument has taken on a very different turn, that there is a, a, a something toxic now in the argument that has resulted in certain legislative um, um, innovations in the, in the Knesset. And so I'd just like you to comment on how you've responded to um, what's taken place over the last year, some of the campaigns of what's called demonization within, you know, within Israel on both sides between the left and the right and how you address that as a novelist and as a political commentator. Well, I'm very worried about the recent legislation initiated by the more militant wing, right wing in the Knesset, a legislation aimed at boycotting and delegitimizing sections and segments of the Israeli society. I think this is a sign of weakness. I think everything that is aimed at limiting the healthy diversity in Israeli society is dangerous, dangerous to the Israeli society, and in a deep way, anti-Jewish as well. Okay. okay, we've got a question here. Just upstairs. Hi. Um, just have a question. I've recently Googled your name, and I found a um, uh, an inscription that you've given with your book to Muhammad Barghouti. Yeah. And I was just interested knowing what's the reason for that, because you just described the um, percentage like 60%, 40% of, 60% um, of the majority of the Palestinian that you claim that this is the same majority, not the fundamentals, and I wanted to know if you see Muhammad Barghouti as one of them. Well, Marwan Barghouti is a Palestinian leader who serves a life sentence in Israeli jail for terrorism. Like many leaders of the third world who served sentences for terrorism under British, French, Belgian or Dutch administration in the previous colonies. I have known Barghouti from before the Intifada and I have known him as a pragmatic Palestinian who maintains that the only solution is a two-state solution and who advocates openly an historical compromise between Palestinians and Israelis. I don't admire him and I don't join him in his actions and I don't identify with his actions. But nonetheless, I inscribe my book, A Tale of Love and Darkness, to Barghouti, saying in the inscription that I hope he will read the book and get a better understanding of us. If this book, A Tale of Love and Darkness, will make Barghouti more aware of the Israeli Jewish Zionist narrative, then I have done my, my part. In fact, I would not hesitate to sign the same book to Ahmadinejad and send it to him if I am guaranteed that he will really read the book and benefit from it. Okay. Okay. We're going to take a last question just on the top here. Uh, <clears throat> I have a book at home called the, the Gun and the Olive Branch and it goes into the history of Israel and the beginning of, of the taking of land and, and the fighting. And I live in a country that has had that problem as well. Um, when the Zionists came well before World War II, uh, they wanted land. But there were people on that land living off the land, poor people. Yep. Then I saw a Palestinian intellect and her idea was a one-state solution. 
where everyone shares as the example and the denomination is not made in this modern world by your religion. It seems that us Jews get all the breaks in this situation and the amount of land that the Palestinians now have and the amount of land that the, us Jews now have is deeply un, improportionate. Okay, so it's a question about what one, do you have to one say state, about two state. A one state situation because land was taken. Yes, a one land solution will be a bad solution because the Israelis and the Palestinians are not likely to become one happy family after 120 years of animosity and hatred and violence and bloodshed and injustice. It will be very naive to accept the two enemies to jump into a honeymoon bed together and become one happy family. The Israelis and the Palestinians are not one and they are not happy and they are not family either. They are two unhappy families and therefore they need, at least for the foreseeable future, they need a two-state solution, a semi-detached house as a first step. Eventually we may have a common market, we may have a Middle Eastern Federation, we may have a United States of the Middle East. But step one ought to be not a romantic honeymoon between the enemies, but a fair if painful divorce. And I know it's going to be a funny divorce because the two divorcing parties are definitely staying in the same house. No one is moving out. So we will have to sort out who is getting bedroom A and who is getting bedroom B and what about the living room and spatial arrangements will have to be made, made about kitchen and bathroom because the house is very small. But where is the alternative? There cannot be a one-state solution. One-state solution doesn't seem to work anywhere. It collapsed in former Yugoslavia it collapsed in Cyprus, it collapsed in the former Soviet Union, it collapses everywhere on the globe. So to inscribe a one-state solution for two deadly enemies such as the Israelis and the Palestinians is at best unrealistic.